I think that uh, just to lead us off here uh, before introducing the speakers, you know, one of the things that's come up is this kind of data explosion, all of the data that is available out there. Um, but we have to be clear about one thing. Data is not knowledge. Knowledge is power, but data alone is not power. So this session is a lot about how do we do effective dis decision making and genetic testing. And that is not just about data. So we have a really hard challenge ahead of us because as was mentioned earlier today, it's not going to be in the technology where the cost is, it's going to be in the follow-up and the interpretation. So a lot of the questions we're asking around what are the, the right clinical questions that have to be answered, it's where do we focus our time and energy and resources to get the interpretation right, not do we have the right test. So. I'm kind of going to challenge us all today to get beyond just how can we develop the right tests to how can we develop the right interpretation. So um, I didn't introduce myself. My name is James O'Leary. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer with Genetic Alliance. And we have with us today, I think, a couple people that can start answering some of those questions in practical terms. Um, Joan Scott with the National Coalition for Health Professional Education in Genetics, also known as NICHPEG. Uh, Dan Wattendorf from DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, Len Devalio uh, from VA Boston Healthcare System. And Michael Burgess from University of Br British Columbia. So we're really kind of coming from many different angles, but I'm hoping in this kind of short time we have on this session, we can get practical on where to focus, what are some good examples that are out there um, on systems where we have actually effectively answered uh, the question of decision making and genetic testing, um, and also so we can lead the way for evidence, the questions around evidence and data generation for the rest of the day. Where is it that that needs to focus, and how can it feed into this question of decision making? So with that, I'll, I'll launch us right off uh, with Joan Scott. Thank you, James. I'm glad the way you framed that, that data is not knowledge, because that really is the, that's the tricky part to make that leap. So first of all, let me just sort of tell you my perspective. Um, uh, I am the executive director of the National Coalition for Health Professional Education and Genetics, or NICHPIG, and we collaborate with groups uh, to develop um, educational and information system for non-genetics healthcare providers to help build capacity within the healthcare provider community uh, to um, respond to and, uh, and use appropriately uh, genetic um, applications. So I'm sort of coming from the perspective of the general clinician who is not genetics trained. And if we are going to really disseminate and um, realize the benefit of personalized medicine, we have to build capacity within that within that com community. So I want to make uh, take my few minutes here to sort of make three points and then maybe make a couple of suggestions to help frame our conversation around, around this issue. And my points are not necessarily new or revolutionary, uh, and they echo much of what Reed actually said um, earlier today, and I think they're worth sort of coming back to. So the first is around uh, complexity and clarity. Uh, the second is around access, and the third is around support. So first of all, uh, regarding complexity and, and clarity. Um, it does bear reminding that we do have a very complex health care system. Um, and we also, I think sometimes the conversation around genetic testing gets um, bogged down because we tend to, te uh, we tend to um, uh, treat all genetic tests as being equal. And in fact, genetic testing is as complex as our healthcare system. So there's tests for diagnostic purposes, for predictive, for developing treatments or deciding treatments, for reproductive health decisions, um, for um, uh, public health screening, uh, and individual clinics, so clinical care. So I think um, it would help the conversation if, as we talk about the evidence needed to make informed decision making, we do it being clear about in what context are we talking about. Because the level of evidence that's needed by both um, clinicians and consumers is going to depend on the clinical situation and the question that they're trying to, trying to answer. So that's not anything astounding. But I do think it helps uh, sort of focus our conversations. Um, 
the second is comment that I wanted to make is around um, access. And I realize that a lot of the purpose of this panel and the discussion today is to talk about decision making tools and how do we provide, get the information and the evidence in the hand of the decision makers in, uh, in a way that they can actually use it. And electronic medical records are sort of held up as the uh, answer um, uh, that will help disseminate the information into the hands of the clinicians. And Reed showed that very, um, and I'm going to find that slide from because I love it, but our knowledge, you know, our mental capacity is flatlined, but, you know, information is like going way up here. Um, so I would make the point um, that I, I do think the electronic medical record system or, or, or um, uh, you know, the health technology is going to be a huge help in managing, managing information, but it is managing information and data. It's not necessarily helping knowledge. And so as we're building these tools and putting the information into clinicians' hands, we can't forget the fundamental, um, the fundamental knowledge base that helps clinicians decide what to do. Because I don't think clinicians just want to be given algorithms. And when you see this, do that. You know, they want to know why and what's underneath it. So we can't, we can't think of just about information delivery. We also have to address sort of that basic common knowledge. And um, it does start with training. And there are um, medical schools and nursing schools and physician assistant schools who are beginning to incorporate some of that information uh, thinking into there, but we have to we have to acknowledge all of the clinicians that are out there now who haven't had that background, and then the last is support. Um, and yes, it is true that that genetic counselors, and I am one of the thirteen, one of the original thirteen. <laughs> I started practicing before there was DNA. Um, really, we had to go to DNA camp. It was very very. Uh, but anyway. Um, uh, so what was my point now? Uh, <laughs> support. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shoo. Um, yeah, we all need support. Um, uh, yes, we do need genetic counselors, but not, and again, here's where we have to remember the complexity. Not all genetic testing is going to necessarily need genetic counseling support. There are other ways of getting uh, information to patients and to families and to clinicians that don't necessarily involve. So we have to look at other health care delivery models. Um, so, my, so my last minute, do I have, um, is to sort of come up with three sort of suggestions. Um, and one is there needs, I think we need to find some mechanism for sharing information, sharing data. There are a lot of individual efforts that are going, um, that are going on to generate the evidence, look at different healthcare delivery systems, et cetera. How, what's, what's the forum, what's the mechanism where, so we're not all siloed and doing our own thing, but what's the mechanism that we can share information and do smart learning? Um, second um, recommendation is to look for tools outside of the electronic medical record um, that helps build foundational um, knowledge. Um, and that may be using the performance improvement method, uh, that may be developing a better guidelines system, uh, but there has to be additional ways of getting um, uh, what, what Reed was calling as actionable and intelligence. At NICHPEG, we focus on three, co uh, three competencies, uh, risk assessment, genetic testing, and communication, as sort of being sort of the three basic competencies that we want to, uh, to build foundations around. And I think I'll leave it at that. So my comments are based on my experience as a clinical geneticist, a lab geneticist. I see patients one day a week as a cancer geneticist. The rest of my time is as a DARPA program manager. And just looking at a couple of these questions, just as an overview, to me, I still think genetics exceptionalism is, is present. Because when we differentiate some of these tests, I, the, different, the way I would differentiate tests where we use DNA is is either as a functional polymer, which the world is, is changing, and DNA can test a, DNA can test DNA, DNA can test RNA, and DNA can test proteins, which covers the, the what we measure in people. But it also we use those tests to do 
different things. And some of those tests have ramifications on family members, which is probably the most classically genetic. Others have ramification on um, screening so prior to someone has a test, and others for surveillance, and finally as a diagnostic. And I always find myself confused in all of these forums that I'm in and what, what specifically we're talking about when we use genetics. Um, but when I look at this, there's a couple things that have frustrated me for many years as a clinician. And number one is, why is it that in the children's oncology group, almost every child in the United States is on a clinical trial? But the rest of us are not. And so it seems like in, in, the, in the linked world we're in, how come we can't have everyone on a clinical trial if they want to opt in? That's number one. Number two, what it has always frustrated me that whenever I read a clinical practice guideline, originally as a family physician, after the very first couple of algorithmic steps, I have no idea what the hell they're telling me to do. It's just, it goes purely into very, um, not even semantic, non-computable logic diagrams where it just drifts off into the netherland of, of, of what is possible and next. I think a very simple thing that we could do would have clinical, um, excuse me, AHRQ and all of the medical journals that publish in the United States that insist that if you want to publish an evidence-based guideline or even an eminence-based guideline, a clinical practice guideline, that you put that guideline into computable data elements so that we can measure outcomes based on extracting those computable data elements, which, which goes on EHR. Simple policy thing, and I think would give us so much more information. The, the other part to this is, is a, little bit more, um, a little bit more involved to explain, but I will try, and that is when if we link genetic tests, can we learn from them if people opt in? Or if we link any test for that matter? And if we link it, how do we learn? And this goes to the, part, the way business in laboratory diagnostic occurs today. And the example I would like to use is with infectious disease, because I think it's an easier one for me to explain. I'm always surprised. I, I was involved in, a, in making um, RT-PCR in a box for the Air Force. And the, to date, 19, we talk about 17 years for drugs. 1983 was a Nobel Prize for uh, PCR. It's 2012, and we do not have one PCR NAT test in a physician's office approved. I, I, we're hoping to. At least one that I had, had funded is going through the FDA for CLIA waiver, but it doesn't exist. So why cannot we de-link the ability to put distributed tests on people anywhere where they happen to get their care, either at home or a physician's office, not necessarily in a tertiary care center, with the knowledge that is created. The example with infectious disease is this. When those RT-PCR boxes for respiratory illness first came out, let's say you could test 20 upper respiratory diseases. It was very interesting, for example, that two diseases at the same time were actually leading to more clinical sequela of a respiratory illness. So if you had coronavirus, not typically thought to be a big deal, but co-infected with another respiratory virus, you would have a much different clinical outcome. And how did we learn this? Because we had a astute laboratorians who were reading the box, the outcome off of these RT-PCR platforms, who happened to be in a large medical facility and tracked the clinical records with those patients. And to date, even with EHRs, they're physically tracking the clinical record. Yeah, I've run a diagnostics lab, and what we get in a diagnostic lab, when anyone orders a test, even now in DOD with a $2 billion EHR, when you are running the diagnostics lab, not as a physician, what you see is administrative data, the demographics. You don't get the clinical data with the test. It needs to be linked to the test forever, not so that the physician gets it, so that the laboratorian who often knows the most about how to interpret this can be helpful to the clinician. They don't get that information. It is not difficult to do, and it could be done. So I think if you could link the, the data, so let's go back to this example with these RT-PCR boxes. Businesses sell RTBR. PCR boxes to hospitals and large tertiary care centers, and those astute physicians will, will, will put papers into journals once they have results. But the rest of the world is linked. Why are not all RT-PCR boxes for respiratory illnesses around the country linked to one centralized database? Whoever makes the machine, who, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what the business model is, but link it all and make it a centralized aggregation. And if you need people to opt in when they turn in their test result for an infectious disease or for a genetic condition, allow them to opt in. But aggregate those data and then let the few experts you have, clinical geneticists, genetic counselors or otherwise, be connected to that data and be able to give some kind of 
real time learning and result report back because we just don't know what we're doing with many of these diseases and conditions where we don't have the money to do these large RCTs. It's just not, we're never going to have evidence unless we somehow link this. So I think the business model for laboratory testing needs to change where the tests are linked and I think that would make a huge difference. And you know, those are, those are my comments. Thank you. So um, I think that's a great intro talking about um, how data is not incredibly useful. And uh, as uh, the Associate Center Director for Biomedical Informatics uh, in a research organization within the Department of Veterans Affairs, and as a, a researcher, um, which I tend to do on the side a bit, is, um, is what happens when data is the easy part? Uh, what happens when it's not the $1,000 whole genome sequence, which we tend to talk about today, uh, but, but the $100 whole genome sequence, uh, which um, I think is probably less than two years away based on what some of the folks are advertising these days. Uh, what happens when for $10,000 you have a machine in every hospital, if not every department, that can produce a whole genome sequence of clear quality in relatively short time? So we've been thinking about this a, a little bit, but but we thought, well, we have we have plenty of time, um, and, but that's that's not the case, and it's it's my group's job to try to develop the information infrastructure for the Department of Veterans Affairs to try to get us ready for these sorts of things, and and uh, so I've been going down the list of um, you know what happens when data is the easy part, and it we don't order lab tests for a thousand dollars that look for two or three genes or even a thousand biomarkers, we just we just go back to wherever the whole genome sequence lives, and we take down whatever referenceable information is available to us. I and mean, that's, that's as disruptive a technology as, as it gets, right? We're no longer ordering individual lab tests. We're just looking up what's already there and pulling down information that's relevant. And that's constantly being added to based on the latest discovery. This is, this is not a new idea. These are models that have been proposed based on the assumption that at some point we're going to be able to do $100 whole genome sequencing anywhere in the field. Uh, I was at the Molecular Tri Conference not even a couple weeks ago, and I was very excited to learn that one of the companies that's vying for the $1,000 whole genome sequence thinks that they're within a year. Uh, two hours later, I listened to a 10-person startup talk about how they are within one year of the $100 whole genome sequence. So this is, this is all happening very quickly. So you need to, when you think of testing and decision support, Step outside of the mold of sending off an individual test and getting back a few answers. Start thinking about the whole genome living somewhere and pulling down what matters for your situation. And start thinking about all the secondary data you're going to have to deal with as that information starts to come down. So I, I've been creating a list of issues we're going to have to deal with, and it's, it's far more than we can talk about here, but I'm very selfishly going to touch upon the few that within the Department of Veterans Affairs we're already starting to try to take on with some pretty large-scale projects. The first issue which has been touched upon by Dan uh, is personalized medicine needs people. So when you, right now most of what we know about personalized medicine, most of what makes it to a test, we take people with the disease and people without the disease and then we conduct a million or so t-tests and we look for that one marker that's off the chart. And that's been great. We've learned an awful lot that way. But when you have a whole genome, you're introducing, depending on what you look at, at least a few million more variables to your model. In study after study with genome-wide association sequences or science, whatever you want to refer to it as, we're seeing that with 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 patients, yeah, we've kind of picked all the low-hanging fruit. Now we see that there's a few markers, and if I only had another 10,000 patients, I could give you some actionable results. We already have a recruitment and enrollment problem in this country in terms of participation and research. What's going to happen when the data is easy, but now we can't find the patients to participate? So within the Department of Veterans Affairs, what's going on right now is the Million Veteran Project, or MVP, and the idea is to get one million volunteers to give their uh, access to the EMR blood data, survey data, uh, where uh, the system's been fully operational since um, probably November, and we have 40,000 patients thus far. Uh, I, think, I think that that's one way of doing it, but I think that this is not an institutional problem, it's a societal one. And what a great opportunity to be able to speak to this group to, to say, please spread the word that if people don't participate in research, 
we're going to be stymied in what we can learn and how we can put it into play. And in our study, before we did this, before the VA invested millions of dollars to do this, they did a study to find out what would veterans do if we asked them, would, would you like to put your information in a, in a database? And the overwhelming response was uh, that uh, yes, right? Something like 80% said it's a good idea, 70 plus percent said I would contribute my information. So give patients a chance, hospitals, doctors, uh, everyone needs to start this dialogue and start it soon so we can, uh, we can get the numbers up and be able to actually learn from this. The second thing is uh, next generation sequencing is going to need to be followed quickly with next generation phenotyping. So as I said, when we talk about personalized medicine, it's people with disease and it's people without. It's not very personal. A disease is far more complex than a binary variable. Uh, and so if we're going to do the science, and if we're going to apply this in decision support, we're going to have to move toward models that think of disease in more complex terms. The EMR is our, our primary source of phenotype. It's not designed for research. It's not designed to learn from. So when we talk about learning healthcare system, please know we're building on a foundation of sand, because the EMR, the only data that's standardized within the EMR is that which you can bill against. Even something as straightforward as a oncology-related pathology report is still free text, right? That has AJCC standardized values that we write in as free text. In some situations, then we turn it into PDF to make it impossible to learn from. <laughs> so the, the EMR needs to come around, and, and organizations like this one need to start alerting clinicians to this need, uh, and the hospitals, because this is not clinicians' decisions unless they're either CIOs or on the panel that buys whatever EMR they go with. Um, next is new models of science. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that we're not going to be able to run $10 million five-year randomized controlled trials for every biomarker we discover. And as a result, only biomarkers that are going to come to market are those that are going to have a companion pharmaceutical. And so we're going to leave an awful lot on the table because our models of science economically are not designed to help facilitate personalized medicine. I, one other thing I'd like to draw attention to that we're doing uh, within the VA is we've just launched right now in Baltimore, Providence, and Boston. The first point of care clinical trial is underway. And what that means is basically we took a clinical trial and we jammed it into the electronic medical record as part of our point of care research program. We're taking the cost of an observational study and the power of randomization to figure out the comparative effectiveness of different drugs. Uh, so right now when a doctor goes to order, either weight-based or sliding scale insulin, his first option or her first option is randomize the patient. And so we have to get rid of this idea that research lives in one set of buildings and abides by one set of policies, and then clinical care waits 17 years for one of their findings to make it over the wall. Uh, and uh, we think, although we're starting with comparative effectiveness, this is going to be huge in the biomarker space where you just can't afford to run the clinical trial otherwise. Um, the final thing I'd like to just say is that uh, this idea of uh, um, clinical care versus science is two different things. Um, is is uh, Everything has already been set in place to keep those models alive. It's going to be up to patients and up to organizations like this one to start demanding that learning healthcare system be more than a slogan that's used quite often. Uh, and that personalized medicine is, um, is, is much more than a test for a couple markers based on a binary phenotype. I'll get off my soapbox now. Thanks. I come from a perspective in healthcare ethics. So I have a chair in biomedical ethics in the Center for Applied Ethics at University of British Columbia, as well as the Department of Medical Genetics. Um, I've always asked questions about how do we introduce into our reflections on healthcare alternative perspectives, minority perspectives neglected perspectives within the healthcare system and society. When it came to genetic testing, that led us to do ethnographic studies of families with, at risk for Huntington's, with BRCA1 and 2, with early onset familial Alzheimer's, to look at what the experiences of families and communities were as their disease that was familial and inherited became labeled genetic and was tested for. And we were concerned about just exactly how that would change the nature of their experience. Um, and we saw some of the things you've already heard reported. There, there were surprise negative reactions to good news scenarios. So probably one of the most graphic is someone who's told that they do not carry the mutation for Huntington's disease, takes on increased responsibility for the rest of the family because they're no longer left with that particular legacy. Closer? 
and so they feel uh, a stronger obligation to the rest of the family. We've, we've seen adolescent young women become very obsessive about breast self-exams. So there are, there are these kinds of things about the worried well that can be created by this knowledge. That doesn't mean that we don't have to find ways of sharing that knowledge. It means that we have to find ways of supporting people to be able to better deal with that kind of knowledge. But let's back up, because some people have already been pointing out there's a big difference between knowledge and data. We're talking about wanting about outcomes and health. In the Canadian healthcare system, we're challenged, I think, to ask ourselves, given that we're concerned about equitable access to health care, what are the things that we can say that an equitable system can accept inequalities about? There are some things the healthcare system won't be able to deliver, and we have to be able to find ways of being able to assess what that will be. We're seeing increases in private expenditures outside of the healthcare insurance plan in Canada, but most of that is secondary insurance. There's developing quite a market in secondary insurance. That's going to play a very large role. A lot of that, some of that second insurance is coming out of U.S. sources. So people are seeing the gap in the healthcare system, purchasing additional insurance to cover some of those things, and that'll be a piece of the market that we're likely to see things like uh, full genome scans falling into, where people will say as insurance benefits negotiated by healthcare by unions in their healthcare agreements, the secondary insurance will cover access to certain things because it's in your benefit, but the healthcare system won't cover it. That doesn't mean the healthcare system will have to react. So now we will have data coming to the healthcare system that needs, needs interpretation, and that ends up being quite a challenge. Um, so three points. One is I, I think as we look at where that kind of interpretation, the support for patients and families to understand data that's not yet meaningful comes, um, we've got so many bottlenecks in healthcare, and we keep looking to genetic counselors and primary care physicians largely. Those are the ones mentioned most often as the, the source of trying to clear up that bottleneck. But if we're really talking about population-wide access to a personal genome, um, we really need to prepare a public, wide public base of a way of understanding and coping that with that so that it's appropriately interpreted. So we're really looking at, it's a, I, I hate to use the word science literacy because it suggests people just need more scientific knowledge and they'll be fine, because scientific knowledge has to be also personalized. There is movement called personalized education that talks about how people need to understand and be educated in ways that meets their particular needs in their particular community in their particular point in time. And it's that kind of thing that's going to make the link between data from a human genome and into people's lives. And that's what we have to actually turn to healthcare systems. So we provide a social stratum of knowledge and, and interpretation that then the healthcare system steps into with particular kinds of issues where we need specialist care. Um, the other area that I work in now is um, trying to figure out how we get informed public input around controversial decisions. So I'm in ethics. I, I, I'm unusually comfortable probably with uncertainty and ambiguity, and that makes some people un uncomfortable with the things I do. But it seems to me that one of the challenges we face here is that we can't afford individual privacy and confidentiality if we want equitable access to some of these services and we want to see the kind of progress we're talking about because it's too expensive. And yet we build Ethics itself, if you look at research ethics and clinical ethics, has always been built on the model that we have to protect individual liberties at all costs. And similarly in healthcare, we often say that if something is a benefit, if it's a good outcome, if it's something someone desires, it ought to be funded. But in both of those cases, there's trade-offs associated with that that might make certain kinds of outcomes less, less available to people because we've had to make trade-off decisions. So one of the challenges is, as has been said earlier, um, if we really need the kind of support and the evaluation necessary, we're going to have to look very closely at how do we renegotiate the contract that says your data is your data and you can control it. And when I look at the, some of the approaches that was in Indianapolis two weeks ago, looking at very personalized and granular control of electronic health care records so a patient can say this information goes to this person, this one doesn't go to that person. First of all, I think most people will go to some default and they won't get to that level of granularity because I haven't the time. We know people make quick decisions. We saw that, how much, that, that flat line, how much not, um, information people can deal with decisions. What we're dealing with is an overload of data where people are busy trying to figure out what to ignore, not what to process. And we have to direct their attention to the key information. So we give people that kind of granular control. First of all, many people won't use it. And if we spend a lot of resources developing that granular control, we've wasted resources. And secondly, if they, when they do use it, it prevents us from doing, in some ways, delivering good health care, but in other cases, not being able to do the kind of quality assurance and research that we need. So there is, ironically, this, this place where to personalize medicine, we have to have greater collective investment in a common good. 
And it seems to me that this is the next shift in ethics. So we're, we're trying to find ways of designing trustworthy governance where these kind of controversial decisions can be made. How do we get informed public input that says, what's the trade-off if once you really understand this, what's the appropriate trade-off between your privacy and your confidentiality and the costs of getting, being able to design a healthcare system that can deliver the kind of care to you that's improved? And, and, and then also, how do we make the decisions where there's a whole bunch of outcomes patients want that we might decide ought not be part of the healthcare system. That's part of a separate system. They're legitimate goals, but they're not the goals that have the, the, where the responsibility falls to a healthcare system. And those decisions too have to be made on an ongoing dynamic basis with changing social mores as well as changing technologies. And we need a way of continuing <coughs> to go back and forth between that. And, and I won't go on, my soapbox would be on deliberative engagement of publics, which is where I spend most of my time. But I think we have kind of social technologies that allow us to build that kind of trustworthy governance, and that then needs to be incorporated in how we make these kind of decisions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I will say, Reid, you know, I, I appreciated the flat line of mental capacity you showed, but I liked Joan's, my, the flat lined mental capacity <laughs> better. I could relate more to that. Um, so I think we had a really good, um, a really good overview here, and I'm going to lead us off with a question as people um, come up. Let's see, I'm going to wait till, till after. Um, but my question is on the practical, which is I'm always thinking about scalability in this area. I think we're pretty good at scaling technology. We're pretty good at scaling kind of service access, but we're terrible at scaling initiatives that focus on this decision making area, whether it be. Um, you know, scaling development of good quality information that's accessible to physicians, whether it be training, uh, you know, there's a lot of different areas. So my question is, can you name somewhere we're doing it right in genetics right now that should be scaled, that should be focused on? I think what's going on with Lynch t syndrome is probably a good example. So. I Actually, as a genetic counselor, I think is the first author on the paper that I remember reading a few years back. It was Heather Hampel at um, Ohio State. And the, 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 what was intriguing in this was about three pages into the paper. I, I used to cite it, and I can't remember the data specifically. But the issue was that at Ohio State, they wanted to sequence a group of people, all comers coming in who were affected with colon cancer, to determine how many of those individuals actually had Lynch syndrome, which should have been a, a certain one in 30-something. And they did. They sequenced every single patient through a consent, and they found out that, lo and behold, the traditional family practice, I mean, the pedigree information that you're getting from family histories was not capturing all of the patients that have Lynch because they're small nuclear families, because some people, you know, it's not a complete penetrance, lots of reasons. But then three pages into the article, there was a statement that said, interestingly enough, we identified one, we identified 139 patients. You, someone could Google this, and hopefully I'm pretty close on this. We identified about 139 patients that had Lynch by sequencing. At our facility, only one of those patients was ever referred to a geneticist or genetic counselor because of their family history. So the point was being at a place where you have people who know what they're doing regarding uh, um, Lynch and uh, hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. That model just wasn't working, and I don't. I think I, I more ascribe to the con that five, that line of five is more of like Kahneman's model of intuitive, impulsive thinking versus rational and slow, deliberate thinking. And I think we probably can do a lot on the the latter side. But when when you're expecting people to make a reflex decision, yes, they don't have much time in a seven minute family practice appointment. So I think what has occurred in the past five years. There's a long way to get to this answer, but what has occurred in the past five years is at my facility and many others around the country, we have automated the sequencing. Excuse me, we've automated, it, not the sequencing, the immunohistochemistry and the microsatellite instability, the first set of tests that would allow you to determine whether someone's colon cancer was likely to be due to an inherited cause of colon cancer. And by automating it, 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 compl it solved the problem. Now, you could say, well, is it there, and New York, I think, did have this debate a little bit. Well, is that a genetic test? Because one of these tests, the IHC, if the protein the, is, is not present, it's actually virtually a diagnostic. So you're performing a genetic test on some lady without giving a genetic test. 
But I didn't, you know, you, I have not seen any abstracts or blogs or comments, and nobody from our institution, that was ever concerned or worried about the fact that if we identified them or not through the MSIHIHC with just putting it as a standard part of the surgical consent that there was an issue. So I think the more we can automate things and take it out when it's practical. Now, I think what you said actually was an incredibly important point, and I, 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 if I could dumb it down enough to make it simple and, and punchy, I think it's a question of a public what is the public consensus of informed consent of how much people can share versus the individualized one? And as much we can move into the public sector where there's an acceptance by the community that certain things are acceptable, the better, because then we're not dealing with all of these issues one on one on one every time we have a patient with this, these huge consents. So James, just to, to follow up on your comment, I, mean, I think the other example, at least from the quality improvement side, where there's been a concerted effort in, around a genetic disease is cystic fibrosis, where they really made some huge strides by uh, uh, aggregating data and essentially saying if you want to be funded through the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, you will contribute data and, and it, uh, you have to play. I would also just, in response to Dan's comments there, note that uh, uh, late last year in genomic in genetic and medicine, uh, there was an article that described um, uh, uh, informed consent related to IHC but not MSI testing, uh, treating IHC as a genetic test and MSI is not. We wrote an editorial saying we think that's dumb. Um, you know, this is really not a genetic test. So uh, there is some uh, debate around that, but it, there is at least one article that has delved into that in a little bit more detail. And certainly the practice um, around the country is variable with relation to how uh, patients are cons consented, assented, et, et cetera. So my t uh, I was really um, glad to hear um, basically everybody saying we've got to be able to share uh, data, that that is ultimately where we have to be. And, and it was really um, a pleasure to hear Michael talk about the idea of uh, trying to find a balance between uh, the individual autonomy uh, and uh, the collective knowledge, because that's been a vexing problem and I think is one that we really need to step up to. So really that comes down to two issues that I think need to be formally addressed. One is the treating of what we would I would consider to be phenotypic associated knowledge as firewalled, that only you know an individual has access to that so we can't aggregate it except under certain circumstances. So that's sort of the HIPAA, the privacy, that type of an issue. But on the other side, we also have um, testing groups that are treating variant associated knowledge as proprietary and building a business model around the idea that we'll, we will hold knowledge around uh, these variants and we will not share them and make them available. And I think that that is equally as harmful. And so I think one of the things that we need to discuss is how do we in fact aggregate all of the data in, in a way that is fair to everyone that is uh, participating so that we can really move things um, along faster. Uh, and uh, certainly, as Len said, the standardization of clinical information is absolutely key. We're way, way, way uh, behind on that, and we need to do much better. Last point I'll make is just in response to Joan's comment. For those systems uh, where actually clinical decision support has been uh, implemented fairly effectively, 95% of the docs don't want to know why they're being told what to do. They just do it. Uh, and it has to do with efficiencies and the fact that they trust the content experts that develop the clinical decision support. So I don't think we need to be too obsessive about that, but we do need to make sure we get it right. Um, and just, you know, to that point, which is uh, something that was touched upon on the, the earlier conversation is how we find out the questions that clinicians and patients want answered and also whether people want the background or not. I think we need to do much, much, much more asking. We do a lot of um, determining what are the important questions by NIH review committees. I mean, and this is something even with PCORI, we need to ask people what their questions are. And I just don't think as a community we do a very good job of that. Um, and that's certainly both patients and providers. So as we go forward here and implement a lot of these new technologies, I think it is extremely important for us to go to the source and ask, you know, what questions of yours can we answer um, in addition to creating a lot more questions? Um, Hi, my name is Darla Stewart and I'm with the ARC. Uh, we provide advocacy support to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so this particular part of the discussion is critical to us, which is education. Not only education to the clinicians, but education to the families. 
because obviously part of what we're finding out are things that you can and cannot treat. And so I was grateful to hear from somebody from the Muscular Dystrophy Society. But nonetheless, I'm wondering what you all believe is critical regarding the partnerships between advocacy organizations who represent consumers who might have specific types of diseases or disabilities in relationship to the clinicians and the educational outreach. Thank you. Well, I think that having those partnerships is absolutely crucial and it sort of hinges back on what James was saying about asking and asking what is it that people need as well as what is it that the clinicians need and how do you bridge that communication between uh, between the, the, the two of them. It's both, to me, it's the same, two different sides of the same coin. Um, and there are, I think, models that uh, we can look to um, for, for for how that works and how that can I think we're here because of the that relationship I think when when individuals or groups of people have a specific need that they and they and they're not getting their needs met in society then that, that I think they're the instigators for the change and I think this is an example it, this whole organization is an example of that so I, that certainly uh, certainly a positive relationship I think there's a <clears throat> so one of the one of the potential uh, drivers for this is is the relationship that's being formed outside of healthcare between patients and industry with 23 and me and patients like me and, and websites like this that basically allow the patient to strive toward what's sometimes called the quantified self where they're putting in more structured data than you're going to find in an EMR they're contributing their DNA they're getting back results with interpretation whether doctors like it or not, this is happening, and this is leading to patients showing up more informed and demanding certain types of services that just aren't offered otherwise. And I think that's going to be a very important driver moving forward. I would encourage everyone to uh, partake in one of these types of services, learn a little bit about this, uh, get some experience with it, and then start shouting that your healthcare facility uh, provide you something even close to it. I, I would just make one last comment that's sort of echoes what I said previously about the, the complexity because it is different genetic tests and they are being done for different reasons and patients are accessing them for different reasons and so the why is it being asked and what is the information that people need in order to make an informed decision for their particular family or personal health can be very can be very different and so and so I, I, I just don't think there's a one-size-fits-all either approach to, uh, to what consumers and, and, and patients provide or need any more than it is what providers need or the healthcare system. Yeah, hi, James. Uh, Eric Johnson. Um, I just wanted to point out a potential black hole that I'm sure most people are aware of is that once you've made the transition from the research laboratory into the clinical laboratory, the vast majority of patient data goes nowhere at that point. Uh, these these uh, big databases of, of, of uh, patient data are, uh, they sort of hide behind HIPAA. There's not the resources to bring them back into the research community. Um, I'm blanking on the program that Andy used to run that integrated the excellent program, brought the, uh, brought the advocacy community, the clinical community, and the diagnostics laboratory into a partnership that gave this mechanism for feedback. Without some financial incentive to get that, that huge amount of data out of the diagnostics laboratory and back out into the public sector, back into the clinical community, it's a, it's a huge loss and something that needs to be addressed. Great, thank you. This is actually a question from one of our live streaming participants. Um, do you think that the DTC offer of genetic testing would vanish um, as it merges into the regular healthcare system? I would guess that pharmaceutical companies are going to want to pay to sequence people's DNA in the future. So I don't know if it'll be direct to consumer from that model, but perhaps from uh, from from larger players who want that information. I... It may be that the, um, the the direct to consumer may not be the testing. It may be the opportunity to I don't know troll your genome online and offer you information that may sell services, but it may be an attempt to provide. Um, information, interpretation, solicit your membership, whatever, so that it, it may not be the, the testing that's at direct consumer as much as interpretative uh, services. Uh, Sue Freeman from FORCE. We deal with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. 
Um, I and we're a consumer organization, and I just want to make a comment and maybe get a little clarification on the idea of consumers working with corporations in the biotech community because sometimes there's a tension there and so for the individual consumer it may be that they could work well with um, a model like 23andMe but for the advocacy groups that are sometimes looking at a wider population maybe we need a little bit more of a mediation approach or something that can solve the tension that sometimes exists between the companies and the consumer groups. So. It wasn't so, so much a question, but. <laughs> well, so I, I think there, and you're bringing up a kind of ethical, there's an ethical issue there, and there's a, there's a very practical issue there, which is um, in many ways the advocacy organizations are, uh, you know, serving as a, as a go-between between, between their community and the players that can help drive treatment, provide services, create standards, um, but in that there's an inherent tension um, because by, you know, playing that mediator, uh, there's also funding that needs to occur for advocacy organizations, uh, many times which comes from a lot of those partners. Um, and also there's, you know, differences within a, any community on opinions on directions that should be followed. Hence the lot, you know, kind of the lumping and splitting that occurs among advocacy groups. So, you know, one of the questions I do have is, um, along those lines, is the role um, of data generated from patients in helping inform decision making. You know, there are lots of different kinds of advocacy organizations, just as there are lots of different types of direct-to-consumer companies. Um, what, what data do we need from patients? If we were to, to focus on informed decision making, what is the most important data to be collecting, whether it be through these communities that exist already or through these companies? Where would we gain a lot of benefit that we're not getting from that currently collected within the, the medical system? I think some of the phenotypic data that um, they have the opportunity of getting through uh, patient and consumer groups is potential, uh, very useful. The, what the purists will say is that what's the quality of that information, particularly if it's um, patient entered? And um, you know, does it need to go through a filter so that it's you know standardized medical uh, language, or that you have it backed up with medical records, or maybe it's access to the medical record that you know that you that you need in order to uh, to to get that data. So I think it's more of a quality of the data question as opposed to what is it necessarily that we need. But I, I would also challenge: Is there any future that we could see? where all of this data generation, whether it's from the provider, gr consumer groups, whether it's from the VA, whether it's from Geisinger, whether it's from fill in the blank, where there can be universal sharing of information so that that, so do you, or, or does that help? Um, Seth Meyer from the Huntington's Disease Society of America. Uh, we've tried to create um, a system with genetic counselors for genetic testing, but for a variety of reasons, both in rural areas where there just aren't genetic counselors, but also it's become really cost prohibitive. So people are just going to their doctors, and then we're having doctors just kind of saying, now what? Doctors, I actually recently got a call with a doctor not even understanding the genetic test. So kind of how do we balance that, um, wanting to make this something that's not cost prohibitive, but still getting uh, you know, to the places where they can get the test and it can be interpreted appropriately? So I will show my cards as a computer scientist versus a geneticist uh, by saying that this in thinking uh, through the different models in which this might be delivered when the cost of whole genome sequencing drops to near zero is uh, this is such a candidate for a telemedicine-like model where the interpretation is done anywhere um, uh, but then provided back uh, remotely, especially when the test can be performed 
again, we're talking about a few thousand dollars for a desktop machine in a couple of years. So if the test could be performed right there, the information uploaded to some service, some cloud, and then the interpretation done and delivered remotely, I, I would think that this is how we go from few geneticists to a model that could scale out. But, but maybe my geneticist friends will tell me that I'm insane for thinking in such ways. You still have a person at the end of that phone. What? <laughs> Well, but there's still even if it's a telemedicine, there's still a person at the end of the at the end of the, the the phone. So, and then again, it's like what specifically is the information, and who is the best person to be able to interpret that for the individual in the context of their family and personal history. And I, and <clears throat> but these issues were all had to be overcome even with teleradiology. I mean, the notion of a doctor being in some other part of this country or another and interpreting results was heresy for a while. And then cost, as is happening now within healthcare, drove that down. We came up with solutions. No one would propose that it be done outside of the context of understanding the family situation, but we've found ways to deal with this thus far in other areas of medicine. So is there something so unique that it wouldn't unfold in this way? No, I was thinking more of the time um, involved and um, and the time that is sometimes it needed with some you know clinical situations for uh, that uh, th that physicians may not have and um, so again sort of depend context dependent but it was really more of a time issue that I was thinking of. Okay, uh, last question. Um, yes, your excuse me, Bonnie Liebers from. From Schenectady, New York. I'm a genetic counselor and have been for um, about 30 years or so, like yourself, Joan. Um, but you're right, you do need a counselor at the, or person at the end of that phone. Um, and although we do have a, um, 2,500, I think, registered genetic counselors in the country, and maybe 3,000 altogether, um, including people who work in research, et cetera, those genetic counselors still can't provide access to, those, to the patients that are looking for that particular information. Um, in, New, in Albany, New York, upstate New York, um, we certainly have a medical center with several genetic counselors. But where I work, 20 minutes from um, upstate New York, um, excuse me, Albany, New York, and Schenectady, New York, um, patients who come to who are referred to me for genetic counseling, and I'm part of a private practice. Um, I, I've written dozens of letters to medical many of the insurance companies that are even here, Blue Cross, United, etc., and they do not credential genetic counselors. The community hospitals, and there are about five or six of them who are would like to put a genetic service in practice, um, cannot really afford to hire a geneticist to run a service for the billing to happen for genetic service. So they sort of refer to me, um, and I do have several contracts with insurance companies. But you know, I can tell you that just within the last week or two, with Blue Cross, Blue Shield, United, and the men, many of you people who are here. I've gotten letters of refusal to see patients, provide service to them, and I do have a telephone consultation service called geneticcounselingservices.com um, with contracts through these insurers, but I have the letters on my desk that say, you know, we don't contract with genetic counselors, either you don't have licenses or we only go through a large medical center. So I'll say to my patients, well, you have to go to Albany Medical Center, and then I'll call there, and they'll say, well, your oncologist has to refer to our oncology service to that particular patient in order for that patient to receive genetic counseling. And the oncologist in the community hospital says, why should I refer to another oncologist and have all those services go over there? So here I have you know, on my desk right now a patient who has an APC gene for familial adenomatous polyposis. She has an eight and 10 year old child and she would like them tested, but she can't receive genetic counseling to get them tested only if her oncologist sends her to another neighboring oncologist so that he can bill, and he's billing by virtue of a genetic counselor who's in that institution in his own name, certainly not, no recognition of the genetic counselor who is providing the service. And in New York State, there's a Medicaid um, policy that went through in January of, of 2011 that is approving the only AMA genetic counselor billing code that there is, 96040. You're laughing at me, but this, this is really the crux of the problem. You're talking about a bottleneck of genetic counselors, and there's only probably about 5% of them who can bill in their own name in licensed states. The other 95% of them, 2,200, are billing under a physician, or you know, the good number of them are sort of unemployed. 
and not able to ac help patients access the system altogether. So uh, facing a lot of questions on helping patients make informed decision making around these tests and what are the models we're going to use going forward. So with that, um, I want to thank our panelists and we'll move on to the next session.